Yeah. Hello again. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour, and we're ready to go again. Tonight is the live show. I hope everything's going to be all right. We've already had the gremlins working this morning. I mean, right now, that have made me about five minutes late getting on the air. So let's hope the gremlins just stay out of the telephone lines tonight. Uh, I'm calling on the, to the big island in Hawaii, and the email I got said they're having terrible storms. So let's just hope we'll be able to keep the connection. But before we get going, before I introduce my guest, let me give you the toll-free number in case anyone does want to call in. And okay, they said we won't be able to take call-ins. They have us on the line so that in case anything goes wrong, then we'll be able to switch. Okay, my guest tonight is David Donnell, and he's on the Big Island in Hawaii. Are you there, David? I am indeed, Dolores. Aloha. Okay, aloha, because your email kind of had me concerned. <laughs> uh, tell us what's going on there right now. You said there's terrible storms. Well, um, I'm uh, sitting here in the little village of Volcano, around 4,000 feet up, right on the shoulder of Kilauea Volcano, the mo world's most active volcano, uh, about a yeah, mile. Yeah, I've been there. I know. That's right, yeah. yeah. About a less, less than a mile from where the uh, activity is. And for the last 36 hours, we have had torrential, and I mean torrential, monsoon rains. And sometimes it's so loud that I can't even hear myself think. So, uh, so far the, the house has not floated down the hill, so we're okay. Okay, because you did say that they were under fl uh, flash flood warnings and they already had rock slides. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, the, uh, there's flash flood warnings and there are some flash floods um, on several parts of the island. And, uh, and there have been some rock slides in some of the highways. And uh, that's mm. kind of normal when we get this weather. The weather itself is not that normal, but... But, you know, that's all part of living in paradise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's the way things are going all over the world anyway. They said the weather isn't normal anywhere, really. That's right. <laughs> but you also said there's snow up there. You know, a lot of people don't realize that in Hawaii there is snow. That's right. We have two uh, mountains right next, next to us. Uh, one is called uh, Mauna Kea, and the other is Mauna Loa. And they're both just... Uh, just uh, uh, a few feet shy of 14,000 feet. So um, they're both covered now. The peaks are both covered in snow, and when this rain subsides and the clouds clear up, we'll be able to see how far down the snow comes. Last winter it came down to around the 6,500-foot level. So that's a, a lot of snow for Hawaii. And uh, no doubt the snowboarders will be flying over from Honolulu to do enjoy the uh, winter weather. <laughs> I know the first time I ever went to the Big Island, it was a big surprise because you don't think of snow in a, a tropical climate. But the Big Island has got a lot of things about it that are different than anywhere else anyway. It's a, it's a magical place. We feel that we're sort of living uh, in this forest, which is a halfway, a halfway between a Shakespearean forest and Jurassic Park. So it's quite magical. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I know when I've been there, it's like a dividing line. On one side, you have the rainforest, and on the other side, it's like a moonscape. That's right. That's right. That's the Ka'u Desert. And you can literally stand with one foot in the desert and one foot in the rainforest. It, it's that perfect a line. It's because of the, uh, the eruptions and the sulfur in the air and all of that, I think, is all part of it, I believe. I think it's partly that, and I think it's also a history of deforestation, um, where um, uh, there was a time when all of Big Island was covered in these magical forests of sandalwood trees and koa trees and ohia, and uh, much of that was cut down um, and uh, traded off to, uh, to China. Oh, uh -huh. 150, 200 years ago, not long after first European contact, the beginning of the 1800s, and uh, within 
oh, probably 50 years, almost all the sandalwood um, uh, forest had been cut down and traded off to China. It really devastated the island. And then after that, the lands turned into grasslands, and the ranchers uh, took over. And, and at one point in time, I think it was either the largest or second or third largest ranch in the U.S. was on Hawaii. Hmm. When I've been there, too, I've noticed all the big lava flows that, uh, you know, sometimes they would even bury the highways the way they came down. Absolutely. The, the, uh, there was uh, <clears throat> several um, subdivisions as well as a, a village of uh, Kalapana that were completely wiped out by lava flows. And, hmm. um, and uh, the lava continues to flow uh, right to this day. And, yeah, because um, he said it is the most active volcano in the world. It is, uh, yep. but it's also the <laughs> safest. <laughs> <laughs> if anything is, if a volcano was ever safe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's but, a different. Know, I think I told you my friend John Kiergor was a volcanologist right there, and That's he right. took a lot of videos yeah. of the eruptions when it was happening, when the, when they really went down and wiped out the village and everything. Yeah. So it's quite remarkable. But, uh, uh, David, it's a magnificent uh, I've known, I think I've known you now, I don't know, about three or four years, something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's been on the show before, but I know, I uh, think we ought to give you some background so people will know who you are. I met David in Montreal, which is quite a contrast, Montreal and the Big Island. There's a totally opposite contrast. <laughs> but I mean, you wouldn't want to be in Montreal right now. I know that. No, uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Not with the snow there. But I no. met David in Montreal. Oh, it's been, uh, it's been. I think I saw you two or three times up there, mm-hmm. and you were going back and forth. But now you decided you wanted to stay in Hawaii. That's right. And, yeah. Okay. But let's give a little bit of background before we get into the the project that you want to discuss tonight. Um, I'm going to say some things. If I don't have it correct, you can jump in there and correct me. But David was, you were a TV producer, I mean a a film producer in Hollywood for many years, weren't you? I uh, I I was in Hollywood for a few years, and I was in Montreal for many years, and I, uh, I, my, uh, uh, but background. you, you went, uh, well, like most people would think it would be an ideal life, you had it all when you were in Hollywood. You said I did. you went as far as you could go. Well, I, I don't know if I went as far as I could go, but I certainly had a, <laughs> an awful lot. <laughs> I'm thinking materialistic. I mean, you've turned Materialistically, I had, uh, I was I was living the high life in, in Hollywood. Yeah, you had it all in that respect. I mean... They said the big house, the big cars, the, the fame, and all of that. But you said it just seemed rather hollow. It wasn't enough. Is that correct? Oh, I would think that that would be... Uh, hollow is a good word to use when describing Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you decided you didn't want that life anymore. That's correct, yeah. And then, uh, I think the last time we were talking to you, you were talking about your projects you had then with your internet TV. That's right. uh, That's right. You're you're still doing that, though, aren't you? We are, and uh, we've been revamping everything, and we're about to relaunch everything in the new year, just around the corner. And uh, basically what I'd done was gone into documentary filmmaking and interviewing um, people uh, that I felt were making a difference, like your good friend Arun Gandhi. And, yeah. Um, and I was interested in taking these films and these um, interviews and putting them on uh, television. However, the the networks were less interested. So I decided, well, I'll just uh, create my own uh, website, my own internet network, and and start to put the films and the uh, and the interviews up there. And we started to and uh, got a little sidetracked, and so we're relaunching everything in the new year with a brand new look, and there'll be a lot of films uh, and interviews and clips available within the next month or so on on the new uh, dhdtv.net. 
Well, I, I met David last month on the way over when I was going to Australia and New Zealand. We stopped in on the Big Island, and I gave a class there, so I got to see you again. And at that time, you were talking about this new project that you're really excited about. That's right, Volcano like, House oh, Project. A Volcano House. So um, you told us a lot about it, but... Is it okay now to go ahead and tell the world about it? <laughs> yes, it is. I didn't want to jump the gun because you said you didn't want to reveal it until it was ready. Well, we can talk about it now. Okay, so why don't you tell people about this uh, exciting new project that you've gotten involved with? Well, all right. Um, there's a, a park here uh, called Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, which is uh, one of the jewels in the crown of uh, uh, American national parks. I, I would say that it's on a par with uh, Grand Canyon uh, or Yosemite or uh, Yellowstone. And um, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, like all, many of the, the big parks, has um, uh, a hotel and restaurant facility within the park. In fact, it's built right on the rim of the uh, Kilauea volcano crater, so you're sitting right on the crater's edge, looking down at the uh, the hardened lava floor, which we're all hoping is going to erupt and turn into a red hot lava floor within the next short while. There's some indications right now that that may happen, and um, it's really getting ready to happen. Well, uh, the the uh, certainly there's a lot of uh, volcanologists and geologists and uh, various scientists here that are praying every day that it does. <laughs> but there's been some geological uh, evidence that um, that things are changing. So it it did have a molten lava f uh, crater floor for over a hundred years. So uh -huh. um, and uh, and that. Uh, uh, solidified back in the 1930s, but they think it's about to happen again. Well, so, you know, when I was there, but you're not very far from the observatory, are you? About a mile and a half. Well, they they said there, what is it, about 700 uh, earthquakes that happen up there about every day? Oh, easily. Because they, they have instruments that are they're measuring all of that to see the activity in the volcano itself. That's right. So it's, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening that people aren't aware of when they're visiting there. Oh, it's, uh, there's half a dozen seismographs that you can look at, watch through the windows of the, the uh, Jagger Museum and uh, measuring uh, underground activity in the various areas. And um, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, earth movements uh, or earthquakes and tremors happening uh, daily, if not by the hour. It's, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. But, um, and that's where they think it, it is going to erupt but because of those measurements then. Yeah, and the eru when we say erupt, it's not uh, as in the traditional sense of an eruption. It just means that the lava is going to, the, the, the magma is going to rise up and fill an ch uh, underground chamber, and the surface of uh, the lava will uh, manage to break through the, the floor and probably spread out and form a lava lake. Um, <clears throat> right now, it's flowing in tubes underground down the slope to the uh, the next vent, which is at uh, around the 2,000 foot level. We're at around 4,000 feet, and then from there, uh, it continues through these underground tubes to the ocean uh, uh, near the town of Kalapana, where it uh, enters into the ocean. Sometimes, very explosively, enters into the ocean because the lava is 2,120 degrees Fahrenheit, and the seawater is probably in the 60s or 70s, so when the two meet, um, typically there's quite a sort of violent explosion, and you, and you see these bursts. And yeah, that's where the new land is always being created. That's correct, yeah. yeah. There's, uh, there's so you think uh, the goddess Pele is getting ready to awaken, then? Uh, we, we, we certainly hope so, and um, <laughs> in, in the park on the crater is this hotel and restaurant facility called Volcano House. And okay. And uh, Volcano House is quite historic. Uh, I believe it was back in the 1840s when uh, the first um, 
the first form of volcano house was built. Uh, it was back then. It was just a grass thatched grass uh, shack, and over the years has transformed into a more permanent structure. The current structure was uh, built in the 1940s, early 40s, after uh, the older one had burned down. Uh, there's still part of the original 1877 structure in place that's been fully restored, and it's quite beautiful, and it's now turned into an art gallery. But um, the Volcano House is quite spectacular, just like the El Tovar Hotel is on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, or uh, the Iwani Hotel in Yosemite. Um, it's a historic and, and beautiful structure, and it has 42 rooms and uh, quite a large restaurant and bar area. And it's owned by the National Park Service, which means it's owned by you and each and every one of your listeners. Um, it's, it's owned by the American people. And uh, the park facility uh, leases it out to concessionaires, as they do all of the uh, hotel and restaurant facilities in all the national parks across the country. And these leases uh, can be for a couple of years or go up to maybe 30 or 40 years in length sometimes. And quite often there are major corporations like a, you know, a big hotel chain or a big food and beverage chain that may bid on them and, and run them. Um, but we've proposed something brand new to the National Park Service this year. And, uh, and that is we proposed uh, that as a nonprofit organization, a, a 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit, we propose to uh, bid on the uh, uh, hotel and restaurant facilities and, uh, if successful, to um, turn it into a um, internationally accredited hotel and culinary institute. And it, it yeah. would be open to the public the way it is now. Still, uh, people would come and stay there and, and eat there. The difference being that the people working there uh, largely would be students, and they would be students working towards a diploma in, in the hotel and restaurant industry. And we're directing this uh, in particular. It, it's it's a, it's a uh, it's an employment program, is what it is. But in particular, we want, would like to uh, address youth at risk. So we have a mission statement. And our mission uh, statement, uh, if I may, uh, goes as follows. Uh, to provide opportunity to the unemployed and disenfranchised with a focus on youth at risk through meaningful and practical education in the culinary arts, hospitality industry, and Hawaiian culture at a self-sustaining hotel and culinary institute, Volcano House, while enhancing the local and international visitor experience with the true Hawaiian spirit of aloha. Mm. Okay, so you said uh, you have bid on this, or what happened with that? Um, the uh, the park uh, is preparing a prospectus, and we'll release that prospectus uh, hopefully sometime in February of the new year. And at that time, ourselves as a nonprofit um, will bid on the facility, and I'm sure our competition will be uh, rough and rigorous, um, and uh, it, it'll be against major corporations. But um, it's interesting because national parks are all about education, conservation, and preservation, and major corporations are all about bottom line profit. That's true. Whereas uh, a non profit uh, corporation is all about uh, the mission, the goal of the of the nonprofit, and in our case, um, it's to create an employment and training facility, and opportunity. In particular, you know this this economic downturn has hit everyone very hard uh, all around the world, not just in America. But you can imagine what these tiny little islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean are going through um, if people don't have money to travel and come and visit, um, then uh, everyone loses their jobs here overnight. And uh, hotel occupancy now is down to probably 55, 60 percent at best. 
and it's dropping. So um, you can imagine how many people have lost their jobs just in the last six months. And um, um, and yet um, uh, the park manages to hold its own because it is such a magnificent place. It's such a special place. It's such a sacred place. It's considered to be one of the two most sacred places in Hawaii by Hawaiians, and uh, the other being Mauna Kea, the, the 14,000 foot high peak that's just a few miles away from Kilauea. And um, uh, the, the visitor uh, uh, numbers have uh, maintained steady uh, coming to Kilauea and to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. So the traffic is here, and um, we believe that uh, training people to grow food and to uh, be able to cook food and feed people is a good thing, no matter... Um, what type of economy we're in. And it's about the future as well, uh, because the people that we're addressing are just starting their lives. And uh, so uh, it's, it's about giving hope to people and giving skills to people, giving life skills to people, and being able to empower them to feed themselves nutrici nutritiously, but also feed others as well. So uh, we, we feel very good about this project. Uh, a, a nonprofit has never competed in this manner before, and uh, it's always been organizations. It's always been corporations, for-profit corporations, and so um, and and our nonprofit is about education, which is, after all, the mandate of the National Park Service. So we seem to have a, a hand and glove fit here, and uh, it's just a question of us. Um, Mounting a um, uh, you know a, a credible proposal, w surrounded by credible people, and having the sufficient financial background um, uh, to be able to uh, uh, you know clearly indicate to the Park Service that uh, we would be the best choice, and we think mm -hmm. we are. <laughs> yeah, I know when you discussed this with me last month, I thought it sounded like a really good idea and I know your heart is really in this this is something you really want to do it is it's uh, you know you come to Hawaii when one comes to Hawaii and they're greeted with the spirit of aloha it, it's quite a magnificent feeling and it's something that never leaves you no matter uh, even if you never are able to return it's something that stays with you for, for the rest of your life it's a wonderful gift that the Hawaiian people give to uh, foreign visitors and um, and yet, uh, when you come to live here, you get to see behind the veneer of tropical paradise, um, there are an awful lot of people that are struggling. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a place not far from us, just slightly down the mountainside, called Fern Forest. And it's an area where people go to disappear. Um, it's, disappear? It's, yeah, it's to sort of fall off the grid. A lot of people lose their jobs and they become homeless and, and they don't know what to do. And uh, they manage to get themselves together with a, a tarpaulin or a tent or you know a few possessions and they go off into the jungle and they just... Uh, set up camp, almost homestead or, or, or squat. And so they um, go to live off the land, you mean? Live off the land. And, you know, they're proud people and they don't want to accept help. And, um, uh, you know, interestingly enough, we ran into this gentleman, uh, Father uh, George da Costa, uh, who's a retired uh, priest from the Hilo Parish, a Hawaiian uh, priest. And um, he had been involved in social justice and uh, and causes for for the the less fortunate all his career and and then uh, you know he, there came a time when he retired and um, he uh, along with some others um, get donations put together and once a month on the third Thursday of every month they uh, go down to this area of fern forest and there's a little community center. Community center sounds really luxurious. It's 
three corrugated uh, tin walls with a tin roof. It's completely open okay. air, and um, and so whatever temperature it is, and it can get cold. Right now outside for Hawaiians it's quite cold. Up here it's around 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So if someone that's used to 85, if it's 55 and they don't have any sweaters, that's cold. And, um, yeah, I remember when we went up there, it was quite a different from being down at Kona. Oh, yeah. When you climb up there, you, know, you can feel the difference. Oh, you can feel the difference. And, I mean, it's freezing. It's a, it's below freezing on, on the tops of the mountains. So, but, um, It went all the way up where the snow is. That's right. But, uh, you know, so once a month they go down and they, they get donations from various stores and whatnot, and they cook a hot meal. And it took months and months. It took almost a year to convince some of these folks to come out of the, the jungle, literally come out of the jungle and, and, uh, and uh, come and have a hot meal. And there was no gimmicks. They didn't have to listen to any sermons. They didn't have to be converted. They didn't have to talk about anything. They didn't have to talk to anyone. All they had to do was pick up a plate, stand in line, and get food placed on their plate and sit down and eat it. There's absolutely no strings attached. So... So that's something that um, uh, Anne and I uh, participate in on a monthly basis, and um, it's been a very rewarding experience. And recently, um, one of the, the young kids that, that shows up for these meals, um, one of the young kids uh, in Fern Forest was picked up by one, one of the members of our group that, uh, that cooks. And... Um, and uh, they started talking to them about this Volcano House project. And the, the, this young girl was so excited. She just lost her job, and her brother just lost his. And uh, their dream was to learn um, uh, to be uh, learn how to be a chef. Uh-huh. And when they heard that there was the potential for the, the possibility for this uh, institute to be uh, built at uh, Volcano House... They were so excited. They wanted to take down our phone numbers and stay in touch with us and and understand how they could apply and how they could qualify and and uh, so it was really just uh, an obvious strong indication um, from from these young kids um, who are living in these really desperate circumstances. I mean, they don't have any electricity. They don't have any running water. They don't have any bathrooms. They don't have any walls. They have a tarpaulin or a tent you know, some sleeping bags, yeah. and, and they're living outdoors 24-7. And, um, and so for them to be excited and, and uh, you know, and, and have hope just from a conversation, it just shows you the power of an idea. And so um, it's... I bet they aren't enjoying this other you've had in the last few days because you said it's been raining for 30 Oh, I, I'm, I'm sure they're not. I'm sure it's miserable because it's raining so hard and the volume of rain is so intense that you, you just can't imagine how much... Uh, well, picture all of the, uh, the news uh, items that you see on, on the national news of floods and torrents and just, just recently, the other week, uh, there was a water main that burst the east coast and it turned a, a, a regular residential street into a river well yeah, I, I uh, you can imagine news, that's so. yeah and that's that's the type of thing that happens here um as well and uh so i'm sure their lives are not uh, they're not happy right now but you know they have incredible strength and um you know, just reactions like this from kids uh, like this young young girl um, tell us that we're on the right track with this idea. And so um, we're about to launch our website. Our website uh, will be launched very shortly, hopefully New Year's Day, um, January 1st. And it's okay. volcano, volcanohouseproject.org. And, that's uh, the website. That's the website for the project, volcanohouseproject.org. And people... That's all in one... All in one word. And, volcanohouseproject.org. That's right. This, and, this and will people, tell people how it's progressing and how you're coming along. Exactly. And we're going to have, we're gonna have um, a petition where people that, uh, uh, once they read the website and see some of the pictures and watch some of the films, 
Um, if they feel that they would like to support this uh, just morally, um, there'll be a, a page where they can just sign on and just put their name and and what state they're from or what town they're from and just say that, you know, they, they think this is a good thing and they support it. And we're also going to have a page where people that would actually like to apply to go to the Institute uh, can also put their, their name down as well. And we just want to uh, compile signatures of people that want to support it so that uh, when it comes time to go to our local politicians and say, look, this is a good idea, and the, the people think this is a good idea, um, uh, and here's and here are the names of the people that think it's a good idea. I don't know if you just heard what I just heard, but there was a there was a, a loud loud thunder crash just outside. Okay. Right well, I didn't now. hear it here, but you know we were a little worried something might interfere with the phone line. Well, it was the the thunder was so loud it shook the floor underneath my chair. <laughs> Oh, you know, yeah, it, it, the, it, the powers that be are giving a statement here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think it was confirmation that, that the, the forces of nature agree with our, our project. At least yeah. I'm hoping. I, I'm praying that that's the correct interpretation. <laughs> okay. So I couldn't hear it on this end, but let's just hope it holds off. We yeah, keep the phone until we get to the top of the hour anyway. Yeah. But... Um, you said, now these are going to be the local politicians, the ones in Hawaii are the ones that are going to have to decide? or does Well, it the no, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it, the decision is made by the National Park Service. And uh, uh, as I understand the process, it, it uh, when the time comes to submit our bid, we submit it to the local park headquarters, and then they would submit it to Washington and then Washington reviews it, and they in turn submit it to um, a selection committee that's comprised of um, National Park Service employees from uh, uh, fairly, uh, you know, fairly experienced uh, employees from across the nation. And uh, hopefully some of them uh, who have actually worked and served in this park in the past. Um, so it, it's... Um, it's uh, you know it's it's a decision that's made within the park, and uh, from my understanding, there's no political interference. However, having said that, um, it's always I think a good idea to have uh, the public support and your uh, your local politicians' support uh, backing the idea. It just it just uh, signals that um, if the park uh, were to favor one proposal over another that whatever proposal that they would favor has the support of uh, local citizens and uh, and politicians and that they're they're not going against the grain or or going against the current and uh, so now, it, it's just a well, you know, it, of, just, it just occurred to me you know uh, the new president Obama is, is raised in Hawaii maybe he might have something to say about it well, we'll definitely be writing to uh, President-elect uh, Obama. There's no question about that. He's uh, he's on the top of our list. Whether or not he'll he'll actually read what we send him, we don't know. It has to get past, I, I'm sure, quite a few uh, filters, quite a few aids that we'll oh, be yeah. filtering. And that's it. You don't ever get direct to him, but I was just thinking this might be something he would want to support if he knew about it anyway. Well, uh, I think he would. He's... Um, his his wife has stated publicly that uh, in order to understand who Barack Obama is, uh, one must first uh, go to Hawaii and and learn about Hawaii. And once they understand Hawaii, they'll understand who he is. And I believe yeah, that to, to be true. He's over there right now. Yes, he is. In fact, uh, yeah, I, I'm told that at one point he's here for two weeks, and he's been staying in in. Um, Kailua area on Oahu, and visiting the uh, the U.S. Marine Corps base uh, frequently over in uh, Kaneohe Bay. Um, but uh, I'm told that he's supposed to come over to the Big Island uh, at the latter part of his visit. However, if these rains continue, I don't think he'll be doing that. No, so, it doesn't sound like it. Probably wouldn't be safe anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know. Hmm. Well, uh, when are these decisions made? 
How much of a timeline are you going to have? Um, well, the prospectus is going to be issued in February, and then we have three months, 90 days, to, uh, to submit our proposal. And then after, so that brings us up to somewhere in May, and then after that, they take another three to six months uh, to make their decision. Uh, they may, they could make it quicker. They could take a little more time. But uh, regardless, the decision will be made before December 31st of 2009, a year from now, because yeah. that's when the uh, the current uh, lease uh, uh, the current lease expires at that time. And, so something uh, has to be decided before the lease expires. Then that's right. And then and then it's just a, it's it's kind of like the. The change in the presidency—it's just an orderly transition. There's a transition team that that goes in, and uh, you know they look at the books and they look at the reservations and they talk to the staff, and uh, and then it's an orderly transition from one concessionaire to the next. And Volcano House remains open and doesn't skip a beat, and uh, visitors keep coming every day. Volcano House tends to be booked uh, solid. Uh, well in advance. Sometimes they get reservations years in advance, and uh, it's it, with with two million visitors coming through the park uh, every year, and only forty two rooms and three hundred sixty five days in a year. You can imagine that it's. Uh, but you know, the, it, it, it's it's not to discourage anyone that's listening that may want to go there. There's, I'm sure, there's always the possibility of uh, of getting a room, and there's. Uh, you know, you can imagine that last-minute cancellations are not infrequent um, because Hawaii is 2,500 miles away from the nearest landmass, so it's uh, it's uh, it's a long ways to come for most people, and um, and so uh, travel plans do change. So, you know, all you have to do is try, and you'll probably be successful in getting a room. So. Um, and anyway, even if you do succeed in getting this at this uh, the uh, culinary school you want to have, the uh, hotel will still remain in business. So, well, you it's know, it, it, it's the hotel. The the culinary school. The way we'll we will work it is there. There are other buildings where we can uh, set up uh, classroom structures. There's the thunder and lightning again. Um, there are there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I tell you, Dolores, I'm living in Jurassic Park. The only thing that's missing is a Tyrannosaurus Rex to come running out of the 500-year-old <laughs> hapu tree ferns, you know. But, they come uh, in and push your house. Huh? That's right. Um, but uh, <laughs> we'll have classrooms uh, set up and facilities, and there there is a dormitory as well uh, in the park right now. And... Uh-huh. Um, and then uh, we'll, what we will do is we'll make sure that anyone working there currently doesn't uh, lose their job. And, in fact, they'll also be offered opportunities to, um, uh, to uh, uh, even participate in, uh, in, the, uh, in the curriculum so that they can upgrade their own experience. Um, I, I, uh, this whole idea happened um, many years ago when we were on, on Oahu, uh, a friend of ours had asked us to come up with an employment um, uh, plan for a uh, depressed area, economically depressed area of Oahu, and they had some abandoned sugar mill buildings, which are like large airplane hangar structures. And so they had asked us to, and so we came up with this idea. And, and partly was because back in Montreal, Canada, we have a very good friend uh, who's a world famous chef, Chef Jean Louis. And he's been on the Jay Leno show, the Tonight Show with Jay Leno, and he's been on Discovery Channel and TLC and all across Canadian television in France and Switzerland. And uh, he happens to be the head culinary uh, professor at uh, the Montreal-based um, International Hotel and Culinary Institute. And uh, oh, okay. so he had offered... Um, to put together some of his retired colleagues and to come to Hawaii for six months to uh, set up the curriculum and train uh, any of the chefs, uh, the local chefs and the local administrators on how to run the institute uh, 
uh, effectively, and um, and so he has once again offered that um, opportunity to us here. So we have uh, some really wonderful people uh, on the uh, institute side that would be able to come and help us structure this, and they would form a selection committee and interview local chefs and administrators and. And then uh, once once hired, they would be properly trained to be able to run the institute. And then Jean Louis and his colleagues would just withdraw after six months and go back to their their jobs. And uh, and by the way, I should I should tell you a little bit about Jean Louis. He's a very interesting man. He's from Madagascar. He's an indigenous Malagasy, and he uh, won a scholarship uh, to go to Montreal. 30, 40 years ago. I think it was Hilton Hotels. And he was trained as a chef. And he's become a five-star chef. And um, he and his wife, who is, uh, has just passed on a couple of years ago, uh, they started the French version of Chefs Without Borders. It's called Cuisinier, oh, okay. Cuisinier Sans Frontières. And so what he does is he has these benefit dinners and, and people donate money and they take the money and they fly over to Africa or Madagascar or different places to these impoverished nations and he selects 18 kids and he literally goes into the jungle and he finds 18 kids. He took a 16-year-old girl who was living in a cardboard box and uh, um, amongst others and he brings them to a facility where they get them all showered and cleaned up, and they dress them in new clothes, and they dress them in crisp white chef uniforms, and they train them in a, in a commercial kitchen and out on a farm, and they, they give them a three-month crash course, and they teach them how to plant, to grow, to harvest, to ripen, to prepare, to cook, and to serve food. And his philosophy is that cooking starts in the garden. And so um, at the end of the three months, they graduate with and they receive a diploma. And then he personally gets them into his car and drives around to all the local hotels and restaurants until he finds each and every one of them a job. And he doesn't leave the country until everyone's employed. Wow. And they've been doing this for several years now. So uh, it's phenomenal what he's accomplished. And we're hoping that he'll not only help us set up Volcano House here, but he'll set up the Pacific um, region um, branch of Cuisinier Sans Frontières because we'd like to see graduates of the Volcano House Institute uh, spread out across um, the Pacific and the Australasia region uh, doing exactly what he's been doing with his colleagues in Africa. Um, yeah. And do this in his name and in his uh, his foundation's name. So, so there's um, a lot of good synergy here, and and uh, just a lot of um, opportunity. And of course, we're talking about a place that is one of the most beautiful places on this planet. Uh, it's it's absolutely breathtaking to be in Volcano House and look out through the picture windows and see this massive caldera, uh, Kilauea caldera, and then inside Kilauea caldera is Halema'u Ma'u crater, and inside the crater is this plume rising up and uh, bright red lava that rises up towards the surface. And uh, to see all of this, it, it, the scale is enormous, and uh, the, uh, the spectacle is uh, it, it's breathtaking. So, um, and of course, uh, most important, we've just been talking about the practical uh, aspects of this, you know, in terms of uh, the, uh, the culinary and hotel, hotelry skills, but a big part of this is, uh, in fact, it's, uh, let me rephrase that, it's an integral part of it, is, uh, because it doesn't really work well without it. It's the Hawaiian culture. Uh, which is the epitome of hospitality and uh, and the epitome of sharing and uh, and so uh, as part of that, we have uh, formed a kapuna uh, or a group of elders, Hawaiian elders, to advise us in all things.
cultural and um, very respected and well-known Hawaiian elders, um, uh, some of whom are uh, uh, kumu hulas, which is a, a teacher or a master teacher of hula. And as you know, hula is, uh, is, is art, it's dance, it's storytelling, it's religion, it's oral history, it's, it's uh, just a magnific- magnificent experience. And, um, and so we will be bringing back into the hotel ancient hula, which is uh, kahiko. Most people see oana hula, which is very modern dance hula. But we will be bringing back authentic kahiko uh, hula, uh, authentic uh, musical instruments. Um, the, the, uh, the making of the instruments will be made on site, the costumes. Uh, there'll be an art gallery, a music gallery, um, a hula school. There'll be a, a, actually a hula school present at Volcano House and performing um, every day. And, I guess uh, what someone told me when I was there the first time is that the, the hula that the tourists see with the, the uh, grass skirts, that is not the real Hawaiian hula at all. Well, it's there. There is there is a, it, typically what they see. It's um, it's a um, it's a costume, a sort of a variation on a theme. So um, th- they do have um, uh, the so-called grass skirts. There are authentic ones that they do uh, make, and they're made with leaves actually, um, and uh, and they do use them in kahiko and ancient hula, but they look. Uh, dramatically different from what you would see, uh, at, for instance, at a hotel resort or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, well, it really, go ahead. It sounds like you have done a lot of research in, in making your plans for this. Well, we we like- we have been thinking about this twenty four seven for for the last three months. But this was a, uh, uh, something, as I said, it was a. Uh, the revival of a project that uh, Anne and I had created back in 2001. So it's it's been stewing uh, on the on the back burner, um, simmering on the back burner, I guess, for seven years. And um, you know, just recently, it was back in October, and we were at Volcano House ourselves, having dinner there one night, and one of my uh, my friends turned to me and said, you know. Um, this place is up for lease. The lease is up. Uh, it's coming up very soon. And uh, yeah, coincidence, coincidence. And, huh? <laughs> yeah, and and as you know, I don't, I don't believe in coincidences. And uh, <laughs> I mean, neither. <laughs> so, but you, you planted the seed anyway in your mind back in 2001, and it's just right. taken a little while to come into fruition. That's right. The, the it seems that the, um, the our reference to time uh, in this earthly life of ours is different, or is on a different schedule than um, the reference to time uh, from uh, other worlds. <laughs> yeah, I always say everything has to happen at the right time, yeah. and it may not be our time, but it'll be when it's supposed to happen. Everything falls into place. That's right, yeah. Oh, it's been sitting there, like you said, on the back burner stewing, and now maybe it's getting time to come into reality. I, I hope so. I hope we're going to get into a fast boil pretty soon because, um, uh, I, you know, the kids here could... You know, when, when uh, the economic uh, downturn happens and people lose their jobs, um, a lot of people are so desperate that they, they turn to... Um, to drugs, to alcohol, to uh, various substance abuse, to escape from their yeah. problems. And, of course, that leads to petty crime or various types of crime to be able to support their habits. And, um, and so, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is create an opportunity for hope. And, um, well, I think, I think you're on the right track. I think you've got a brilliant idea here. But according to that timeline that you set up, uh, did you, they said you'll start uh, making the submissions about February. Is that when it was? Uh, they they released the prospectus in February, and then by yeah. mid-May we have to submit our bid. Do you have that long to do it? 
We have between so, now I, I, and mid-May to get our financing in place, to get our proposal completely structured, to get support from the public, support from the politicians, um, interest from potential applicants, and uh, and an insurance company that's willing to insure us uh, uh, a hotel and restaurant uh, institute on sitting on top of the world's most active volcano. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a trick, won't it? <laughs> but, you know, the force that be, if they want it to happen, you can always call in Pele, too. She might like it. Uh, I and think if the... It's uh, It'll all fall into place. I think the Kapuna is going to be uh, definitely working on uh, uh, asking for Pele's help. Yeah, because I always said she's one goddess, you don't want to get angry. No. Because when you get angry, she blows her stack. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. The Western world has this old adage where it's easier to say you're sorry than ask permission. It's mm-hmm. the exact reverse here in Hawaii. It's easier to ask permission than say you're sorry. And so we've been busy asking everyone's permission and will continue to do so uh, until we're successful. And I believe that we will be successful. I believe that this is going to happen. And well, I believe know, against all odds we're, we're, going to, we're going to get this proposal through. Well, you know, we talked before about how you create your reality. And mm-hmm. you have to have a dream first, and you know, it all starts with a dream, and then you have to believe in it, and you put all of that uh, energy into it. It has to happen. That's the law of the universe. I believe it. And I believe so. It's already created. You just have to bring it into this reality, and it takes a lot of belief to do it. But uh, what you want right now, then, is for people to go onto the website and but to sign up with their support for you? That's right. Starting January 1st, 2009, uh, yeah. they can go to volcanohouseproject.org, and uh, they can read all about what we've talked about, and they can see some photos and maybe some video as well, and um, there will be a page where they can uh, sign up and uh, support the project. And, uh, you know, we will welcome donations as well, um, uh, certainly any, anyone that can contribute or any organization or any corporation or anyone that's listening at all that wants to, to contribute uh, in any manner whatsoever, whether it's financially or just by signing their name, um, we welcome their support and we welcome their ideas and their comments as well. So that will all be available to access on the website uh, as of January 1st. The instructions, if they want to donate, all of that just be on the website also. Absolutely. All that stuff will be there. Yes, and okay. and, and because we're a, a 501c3, uh, uh, we're able to give a tax receipt for any donation. Oh, okay. And I was thinking I can put a link from my website to yours, too. Well, that would be you know, wonderful. Any, anything we can do, you know, that will get attention. Well, okay. that would be fantastic. Talk to the radio station about putting some kind of a link in, too. I can talk to him afterwards. He does all kinds of things also. Okay. But I think it's a wonderful idea, David, and you're on the right track. And, uh, you know, you start with a dream, and you definitely have a dream, and it's worthwhile. And it'll help a lot of people in the long run. So well, I think I ho- it's one. I, I appreciate that, Dolores, and I, and I hope so. I think you're right. I think... I think that if we can establish a working model here, that this this will last uh, for many many years to come. Long after I'm gone, uh, uh, you know, uh, it'll be a working model to continue uh, continuously help people into the future, and hopefully they can use it as a model to recreate the situation in other places. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. You never know what's going to grow once you plant the seed. You never know how it's going to expand. That's because right. it takes on a life of its own, and then you don't know where it's going to go from there. <laughs> We're coming up to the top of the hour, but I want to thank you for being on, and uh, we do want people to check out your website if they are interested in this, and it sounds very worthwhile. So it's volcanohouseproject.org. And, and that'll, uh, be, that'll be live as of January 1st. Just a few more days. 
That's right. All right, and thanks for coming on. It was wonderful to see both you and Anne in uh, Kona just a month ago. Well, uh, much mahalo and uh, aloha to you and your listeners. And if I could wish your listeners a very uh, mele kalikimaka and a haole makahiki ho, which is Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And the whole new year is going to be wonderful for both of you. I know it will. Well, I hope so. Thank you. And I hope you don't wash off the side of the mountain. And I, I, well, the, the house hasn't floated away yet, but we're still waiting. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again for coming on, and we'll be in contact. All right. All right. Aloha. Good night. Aloha. And thanks, everyone, for listening tonight. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.